count down to the last comic shop in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hey, hey, welcome back to another week of The Last Comic Shop! Where we search through those never-ending rows of long boxes to bring you weekly comic book reviews and recommendations for fans both new and old. And we also try to stay awake long enough to do another comic book review after a weekend bender of fried chicken and fireworks. Wait, don't we get the day off? We should have the day off! Jay, we should go on strike! Chad, we did that several weeks ago. Really? Yes. Oh, then strike again! Strike! Well, I'm the host with the most, Strike. Andy Larson, and I'm joined Strike. as always by my co-hosts, Strike. J.A. Strike. Scott and Chad Smith. Strike. Oh, no, you're not. Didn't you hear me? J.A. and I are on strike. No comics this week. Well, I uh, didn't actually say that I was on strike. Oh, you're one of those management guys, eh? eh? Crossing the picket line? Eh? Yeah. Is that what that is? Eh? Well, I just... Scam! Oh, I just you dirty scam! <laughs> you won't work in this town again! <laughs> all right, all right, scam! enough of that! Strike! You know we can't keep on going back to the last comic shop archives every time somebody on this show eats too much fried chicken! <laughs> you know I'm gonna eat too much fried chicken. You need to plan ahead for these things. And besides, we have that archive arama thing Ah, well, you know what happens when I get Royal Farms in the system, and it is not good. Yeah, I think in the interest of saving us all from the next hour of dealing with um, someone's gastric distress, it's best that we probably find something in the archives just this week. Listen to J.A. I had the beans, too. And they were delicious. <laughs> okay, all right. Oh. Let's go to the last comic shop vault, get it opened, and let's see what we can find. You know, I'll uh, say it again. It's like 20 degrees cooler down here. I I don't know why we just don't do the show down here all summer. Yeah, you know, it's not a bad idea. Quiet! Just... Don't give him any more bright ideas. Sooner or later, we're going to have to do a new show. But that's the American dream, you know? Everyone hopes that they can just eventually coast along on past accomplishments. It worked for cheers. <laughs> All right, well, speaking of past accomplishments, what past content should we pull up on the Archive Rama 3000 this week? Well, it is the award season, so what about that past review of Eisner Award winning Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me by Mariko Tamaki and Rosemary Valerio O'Connell? That was a good one. We had our pal Ethan tune it in, and the beautiful Nicole Larson. Plus, it's good we showcase our efforts to promote diversity in comic books well i can't disagree with that let's go ahead and rub up that archive rama 3000 check out uh, this past review of the eisner award-winning laura dean keeps breaking up with me it's a, a wonderful book that won a variety of eisner's and uh, as a result, we thought it was important that we, we cover it on our show. Because, again, that's what we like to do. We like to tell you about good books out there that you should pick up. And, Chad, real quickly, what's the name of the book? Who wrote it? Who drew it? And how many Eisners did it win? Okay. So it was written by Mariko Tamaki uh, with art by Rosemary Valero O'Connell. The book is called Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me. And the book has won a variety of awards, including the 2019 Harvey Award for Best Children's or Young Adult Book. It won the Ignatz Award for Best Outstanding Graphic Novel and Outstanding Story. And Valero O'Connell's work got uh, Outstanding Artist. And at the 2020 Eisners, they won with Valero O'Connell winning Best Penciler Inker and Tamaki winning Best Writer and the book itself winning for Best Publication for Teens. So that is very, very well regarded uh, among literary comic book circles. And uh, it is, again, a book that uh, does fit into our genre of romance. So, uh, Nicole, what is the 10 cent synopsis of Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me? 10 cent synopsis. High school. (laughs) One person trying to get with a person who's treating them like shit, but they don't recognize it and they just keep going back for more. Meanwhile, they treat their friends like shit and then they finally realize that they're treating their friends like shit and they get rid of the uh, douchebag that they kept chasing after. So, in summary, Laura Dean is an asshole. (laughs) (laughs) That's all you need to know about this book. 
Yeah, so my one criticism, I'll just can I just throw it out there? Sure, why not? Again, it's just the same. I mean, it's the same story we've we've all heard. Yeah, before. absolutely. I, I mean, it's it's straight up like this person, you know, keeps tagging me along. I'm gonna keep falling for it. And I'm going to, like, ignore all the people that actually mean something and care about me. And then eventually I'll realize it and get rid of the the malignant person in my life. Absolutely. Corrosive and, influence in my life. Oh, boy. And, and it before is. we go any further, Andy, can you go ahead and play that spoiler sound effect here? Okay. Put it right there here. Is, there's a okay. spoiler sound effect. Spoiler. Uh, all, all four of us sitting around this table screen, we're all heterosexuals. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all white, and so we are we are very supportive of all races, genders, nationalities, what have you, but we do not live in this world. So if we make any mistakes, please give us the benefit of the doubt. So, yeah, Our so verbiage, what I, we mean well. Um, so the one thing you'll notice I did leave out of the synopsis is to say that this is a, a same-sex or a, a gay relationship. And I think, to me, that's the strength of the book, right? Is that it just treated it as a normal high school relationship. And, you know, until we accept these relationships as a normal part of life, and to, until we stop thinking of it as something so aghast and so different, you know, um, that's when we'll, we'll finally truly be it totally inclusive where we can tell this type of story and just say yep that's the story and, and not really even think twice about the right. sexuality component to it well i i hate to to put it this way but i feel like that's the big selling point to this book though is the gay relationships and it's not just the gay romance the relationship between friends it's relationships between you know other couples and like your friends and your your groups whenever you're in high school and and how all that stuff interacts and and strangers and it all takes place in the lgbtq community um and it treats these people you know rightfully so as people it lets mm-hmm. their drama be a drama without an excess or I, I don't know how to phrase it but yeah, without, I, I without, the, without the dumbing point. it down yeah, I would say. Um, I think it, it's almost crazy to think like how much since um, gay marriage has become legal in the United States. I think that the general population has become a lot more accepting of this, almost to the point where this story was kind of at times boring, if I can say that, just because it was almost like the lesbian aspects of it wasn't shocking at all to me it just felt like real people and it almost felt to the real people to the point of like i've heard this story before you're just putting different types of people in the same scenario right but i feel like that that's important i mean we've talked about it all the time that like you you do need to have books like this that are done respectfully that are truly representational. When you, if you are somebody, you know, that's a teenager and, and, and you're, and you're gay and, the, and you're looking around for a comic book that deals with relationships. Well, how many are you going to find that really tell a story similar to the story we get here? Like probably not as many as we'd like. So right. it's important that these, these these books are still put out there to continue to move the needle. There are that these, these people kind of, are normal. Yeah, yeah. That, that these yeah. people are normal. Yeah, that, 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 that sounds so terrible to point it out, but like that normalization that that's a huge deal. Everybody deserves to have that in life where they can look up and see examples of people that are like them. And again, you have to go back to the spoiler that I said before. It's hard for us to to put ourselves in marginalized people's shoes because. Unfortunately, we aren't marginalized. Like, but we can so. still make connections, and I, I think that's what you were saying with you know how the story is kind of boring. But like, you know, I can relate my own personal experiences to you know falling in love with somebody that's reckless with your heart, and and so let's get into that. Let's get into okay. initial thoughts just about the story. Now that we're we're done monologuing about uh, <laughs> the social implications. Well, I was going to say book. one more thing. So I will say, and just because people you know maybe can't see what we're talking about, but not only is this you know obviously a, a dealing with, um, you know, the gay relationships. But I will say that this is very representative of like a multicultural, multiracial, you know, there's Asian, there's black, there's Latino, like it's, it's very mixed in terms of race too, which I think is nice too, that there's just 
again, just people, right? It's just a good mix. It's not. It feels modern. Uh, like no, it feels representational of the real world. So yeah, let's get into our initial thoughts of this particular book, and uh, we're going to start with Chad. And the reason why I want to start with Chad from a from a story perspective is on previous shows, Chad has mentioned that some of his favorite stories of all time are, are kind of coming of age stories where people find their place. And I feel like Laura Dean is breaking up with me is one of those stories because you've got a main character that does go through a, a growing arc from beginning to the end, has grows up as a person. And so, Chad, what are your thoughts? It's funny because I, there was so much of this book that was different for me and not just because it dealt with gay and lesbian characters. For one, the art is, is heavily manga-influenced. That's one of those things where I, I'm still not necessarily the biggest manga fan. I've been waiting to find manga stories that you know are worth some of the challenges that come with the genre. Although this was told in your traditional like you know left to right. But the other big thing for me was I had to read this on a Kindle app, and boy <laughs> did I hate that. <laughs> As opposed to my normal digital comic consumption. It was one more layer of unfamiliarity where it's like, I can't zoom in on panels. I don't know how this works. And maybe there's a better way to work the Kindle than I figured out. But um, as far as the story goes, it, it was relatable. Like I said, in high school, I had that experience with somebody that was reckless with my heart. And you're like, that only makes you want them more, you know, because they become that wild and free thing that it's like, oh, I wish I was wild and free like that. You know, that's what you kind of aspire to, and you don't realize, that, like, no, and aspiring to be that way, you're just making bad choice after bad choice, chasing despair. I really liked whenever they go to the uh, the DM, the dungeon master lady, and she's like, you're just square dancing, you know? Yeah. Uh, that, was, that was really neat, and then you come to the realization that you have to break up to her, but at that point, Freddy, the main character... Like, there's no way that she's going to break up with her. And it isn't until she finally recognizes, you know, what she's doing to her friends, what she's doing to the important people in her life, because she would drop anything at the drop of a hat to go and be with Laura Dean. If Laura Dean called, like, oh, this is an emergency. I have to be there right away. And it's like, what's the emergency? Like, oh, it's my birthday. Yeah, but your birthday isn't until Thursday. Well, it doesn't matter. Come on, let's celebrate. And meanwhile, she had other really important things to do. And there were people in her life that she was letting down as a result of it. The one thing about this book was I, I wasn't a big fan of Freddy. Okay. For whatever reason, I didn't. He was I, shallow, I just, dude. I don't know. No, I, I wasn't a fan. I enjoyed the, the side character so much more. I enjoyed right. the lady that worked in the donut shop. I didn't see the appeal of Laura Dean or Freddy, to be honest. Right. Uh, I, I, I I gotta say, I, I, I was a bigger fan of Doodle. Yeah, like Doodle's. Doodle's entire story arc was really the heart of this particular book, for me, at least. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, but it's funny because Laura Dean and, and uh, Freddie are the ones that people pine after in the book. But, like, they're the least enviable, like, the least attractive characters involved. Yeah, that, and the shallowest, yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Nicole, what are your initial thoughts? So, again, I mean, I think it was a story we've heard before. Um, I don't want to say it's one note, but, I mean, it's it's, you know. It's nothing groundbreaking. Um, I was with you. I, I really liked uh, Doodle, the character there, and I and I kind of liked the um, ambiguity of of her and Freddie's relationship. Like I kept tinkering with whether Doodle was like romantically interested in Freddie or not, and that was an interesting play. And then of course, you know, doodle ends up pregnant and, and going for an abortion. And then actually I was, just, I was going to make a comment about her dad being like an incredible dad being kind of really supportive about that. Whether or not you agree with abortion, I'm just saying that the dad being supportive was cool in that situation. And, um, I like Doodle a lot and, and the, the evolution of that relationship. And again, that's kind of the main point is, you know, eventually she realizes that she's hurting the people that actually give a shit about her. Dude, I actually liked the art. Um, I do think that sometimes uh, I had trouble differentiating some of the characters and maybe that's that's part of that manga-esque type of uh, style. But um, actually the coloring is really cool because it's mostly black and white and then it's got this pink kind of throughout just in little highlights and backgrounds and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, I liked it. Okay. Uh, Ethan? What I was going to say is that I've tried to actually look at this through the lens of other gay relationships that I personally have known people be a part of. But I've heard of 
open marriages or what have you. And I don't know if it's, if it's me placing my own norms, but I, I can speak to it because I feel like this book is putting a lot of Western norms on gay relationships. You know, there's a certain view of love and it's this story is viewing it through that prism. I can't tell you whether or not that prism is the right prism. It's just the prism that I'm used to. And that's the prism that it's, te- that it's telling you this is the right way a relationship should go. But at the same time, I think that, you know, Laura Dean is, is an asshole. She kind of treats the main character like crap and makes it so that she's not a decent person because... You know, she has infidelity, she has this, and she just doesn't respect the person that she's with. And whether or not you can be still in a really, uh, respectful relationship and have it be open at the same time, I don't know if that's possible. But from my perspective, I don't think it is. Um, and I think that the, the story is trying to tell you that as well. But this is a tough one. I was going to say, too, I think there are people out there that would be interested in the, in the exploration that Freddie goes through. <laughs> whether it is, you know... Oh, maybe monogamy isn't the way that it works. And, you know, looking into that kind of stuff. And then she goes to the party and, you know, kisses somebody else's girlfriend and just makes a train wreck of things. But I I think there are people out there to which this could definitely, you know, appeal. And and once again, you know, just serve as as something that somebody could could hook on to. I I think the story is kind of boring. If you want to say it, like, if you want to call a spade a spade, it's been told a million billion times. But there's so much of this element that it's like, I, I'm i normalizing something that I understand isn't normal for a lot of people. And people are still reckoning with seeing this in print and telling the story because it's it's critically important that we understand and can put it in the frame of saying, we've gotten all the way to the point where it's it's become boring. That's That's an important art. And I can't explain to you how important that arc is for our general society. So again, I, I, I agree with some of the things that have been said that this is a story that's been told uh, a, a thousand times before. Again, most of the time it's with a male and a female lead. He's usually a bad boyfriend and, and the girl that's pining after him and some googly looking nerdy kid that's like, oh, why don't you love me? You know, it's 16 candles all over yeah, again or whatever. Ducky. But at the same time, I think one of the strengths of this book is that it was told in a very quirky and interesting way. There was some really good dialogue in this. I thought the pacing was really was really quite well done. I like this notion that uh, Freddy and Doodle were making these creatures out of uh, piecemeal, piecemeal uh, stuffed animals and stuff, and they had that thing going on. I liked the fact that Doodle was into Dungeons and Dragons and ends up having sex with the DM. Like, this is these little wrinkles, these little facets that were in this book made it seem more real to me. Like, these genuinely felt like real characters to me at the end of the day. And I think that's one of the strengths. I mean, we could say that this is a boring book, but it's also written for young adults. Like, it's supposed to be a book that's written for people between the ages of, like, 12 and 18. And maybe it's boring to us because we've all been through this shit. Exactly. That's the other (laughs) thing. Like, many times. And, like, like, we're jaded. on the other end. We're jaded by life at this point. We've been through these relationships or, and and we've seen our friends be through these relationships. And and, and as a result, it's different for somebody that's never gone through this before. There's going to be somebody out there that's going to pick up Laura Dean is very keeps breaking up with me and is and is is going through a lot of tremendous pain right now because they're going through it for the first time in their life and maybe though they also have the additional weight of dealing with the fact that they're they're gay and they're dealing with that too and like still how the society's trying to catch up with that so they'll pick up this book and they'll say somebody gets me Somebody understands me. Somebody has written this and 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 makes me feel like I'm not alone. And and it's okay that I break up with this abusive person, you know, regardless of whether they're same sex or not. That this is right. not a healthy relationship for me to be in and a healthy way to treat my friends. And yeah. so 
it, kudos to for them making a book like that, I think. And I was going to say, maybe it seems boring to us, too, because, you know, fortunately, all of us have been in relationships and married for, you know, many, many years at this point and, you know, very stable. But like you said, I think we all lived through these types of relationships. And, and I think maybe we don't remember how raw it can be. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, we're all sitting there going, like, why the heck is this bitch putting up with this? Well, yeah, because now as a, you know, middle-aged woman, I wouldn't deal with that type of crap, you know, because I've grown and I've learned and I stand up for myself better than I did as a 15-year-old that, gosh, all I wanted was the approval of that person that I was pining after. You know, we don't have that that rawness to it, that newness. That, that was a good point. I actually didn't really even think of that. So, kudos, yeah. Andy Pants. <laughs> There you go, and I, you bring up the the characters, the realism of the characters, and I think that's definitely true. And I think it's a strength. And for me, it's the biggest flaw. Is and you mentioned at the at the outset how I usually like coming of age stories a lot more. This one left out the fun parts, like okay. the joy for these people. I just don't see it happening a lot, and that's I, I don't know if that's uh, because it's part of the romance genre that it's more leaning into the melodramatic moments. But uh, I, I wish this book had more fun. And that's probably a terrible thing for me to say. Well, there was some no. fun. There were fun moments to have in here, Chad. You just had to look. And, and they weren't obvious because they didn't involve the main characters of Freddy and, and Laura Dean. The, 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 the relationship between Eric and Buddy... Like, throughout that entire book, that was a very strong relationship, a very life-affirming relationship. They truly loved each other. And yeah, but uh, where's the fun? They, they would be the joking. The fun was cutting and, up the animals and putting them... They were joking, they were laughing, they were having a good time in the background, and that, again, it wasn't predominant, but there were there were little slices in there that, you know, that, that, that cut through the gloom a little bit. Plus the fact that, like, I love the color scheme in this. I loved the use of pink throughout, contrasting with the black and white. Like, that, for me, was the fun part. Like, that was just, you know, those... You know what else was fun was the bowling with the dad. Yeah, that was good too. Bumpers. Who doesn't like a good game of bowling? Bumper bowling. Bumper bowling. And the barfing. We forgot about the barfing all over the donut (laughs) counter. I think there's a reason. Yeah, what about her, the donut girl? She she was super fun. Like I would hang out with her every day. The older college girl. Mm Mm-hmm. Anyways, yeah, let's get some let's get some final grades on this. So uh, I'm going to start off with Chad. Chad, what was your final grade on it? I'm going to give it a B, just because I'm glad it's out there for the people that uh, it's it's made for. I'm glad that there are people that you know can see positive representation. I'm glad there's you know there's going to be kids out there where this book is really important. I, I don't want to unload on this book because I, I recognize like. The fact that it exists is a big deal. As far as the art goes, the art was good, but it, it did get muddled at times for me. But I think that's just because I'm I'm a stranger in a strange land whenever it comes to that that manga style that influence that's in here. Um, I just need more exposure there myself. That's a, a thing for me. And yeah, the story, like I said, I just wish there was more more levity, more it, it focused in on the drama more so than anything else. And I, I would find myself being like, uh, this makes me uncomfortable. I don't like having feelings or talking about feelings. Like, <laughs> this is... Open up your heart, Chad. Yeah, oh. no, that's fine where I am. So anyway, Ethan, B. Ethan, um, you're, you're, fu- you're great. I'm going to pull a Chad here. I'm going to say this. I'm going to preface this in saying, this book is not for me. Mm. And I'll say that because I am a father. And I view Freddie as my daughter and the things that she is doing are driving me crazy. And I want to just sit her aside and and give her a hug and, and try to tell her, you know, there's people in this world that will take advantage of you and, you know, use you for whatever gain that they need to use you for and kind of discard you. And you mean more than that to the entire world. But I do understand that this book is tremendously, tremendously important for the people that need to read this book. And there are people out there that need to read this book to see that there's representation out there. If you're in a small town, if you're not understood, if you're afraid, if you have difficulties in your life, if you're going through 
difficult times, if you have, you know, a poor relationship, um, this book is for you. And for that, this book is an A+. Plus. Okay. And Ethan, Ethan, wow, is, Ethan, for someone who didn't even finish the book, man. <laughs> Ethan's real emotional. getting the feels here. So, like, yeah. when he's... I hope that you take everything he just said and really take it to heart. Because, again, he was... My brother, He, he when when something moves him like that, like, it's important to, to listen. So, uh, Nicole, what's your grade? Well, I'll just... I'm just going to quickly piggyback on, on what Ethan says. I mean, all of us are parents here. And I think, you know, at least my you know, the fear of what struggles our, you know, our kids are going to go through and they're going to go through heartbreak. And and the fact of the matter is they're going to go through heartbreak, no matter what type of relationships they have, whether it's straight, whether it's gay, whether it's interracial, no matter what. And, um, you know, it, it is hard. How do you deal with this as a parent? And how do you guide your children through that? And, you know, we're all <laughs> just coming up to this age where our kids are going to start going through this. You know, it is a scary thing and and it is comforting uh, to know uh, or to hope that there are resources out there. You know, our kids won't necessarily want to talk to us, you know. It's good that there's stuff out there that are, are going to be representative of, of all those different types of relationships out there um, that, you know, kids can kind of see that, hey, you know, I'm not alone. I'm, I'm for better or for worse, going through a normal process that everyone everyone goes through so so great uh sorry that got heavy too um i don't know part of me like i said it, it's been like, the story told over and over but like we all said it, it's it's so important that all these relationships that for so long have been called wrong or different or whatever are just are just shown to be normal parts of life because that's what they are they're just normal people trying to to find their way and to find love and 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 whatnot so i mean i'll give it a solid b i like the art i think it's an important book that's out there and uh the story maybe could have used a little a little tweaking for me sure. i will jump on this i'm just gonna say one more thing before your grade okay. is that and actually jacob's really loving this book we bought it a couple years ago now cardboard kingdom um is another young adult or even i mean younger i mean jacob's eight and he he loves it a uh, book that's very representational of differences you know out there amongst kids you know kids that are boys that maybe like to dress up as queens or you know princesses and and vice versa and uh it's just a very good diverse book that I think a lot of younger kids would enjoy. So that's just another recommendation. There, there you go. Uh, my final thoughts are on, the, on this is, I don't know, my final grade, I'll, I'll give this an A. Um, ultimately, I thought this was a, a decent page turner. Uh, I, you know, the thing is, I'll say also that I, I enjoyed the art more than I enjoyed uh, the, the writing, even though I'm giving this an A uh, in terms of the overall book. I liked the art. I thought the art was A+. Plus. There's a reason why she won the Eisner Award for Best Penciler, because I think she did an r- excellent job just kind of bringing some realism at the same time in a very unique style. I loved, again, the shading and the uh, the layout of the pages. It just was wonderful for me. But I won't say the writing was bad. I, it was a page turner. Like It was very easy for me to read, and these all felt like real real characters i felt myself at times putting my feet in the shoes of uh freddie's dad and he was like asking her like oh how's laura doing and she's like we broke up and i'm like oh shit i'm gonna go through that in my life like (laughs) being clueless and being a dad and just trying to be supportive of the relationships my kids are in when you know they might have just broken up and they might be heartbroken there at the bowling alley with me so I, i felt for that guy a lot in that exact moment. Uh, and there was a lot of those moments throughout. Um, it gave me the feels at times. The 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 scene where Freddie goes and meets with Doodle after Doodle uh, says that she's pregnant and they're like their whole just the just the way that it's framed, the way that it's written, it was ju- it was just beautiful and and sublime and so like I think it was it was very well done. And again, I, it, it, it's an A. It's, it may be a story that we've told so many times before, but at the end of the time, it was told really well here. And I'm hoping that a lot of young people pick up this book, whether you're uh, gay or, or straight or, or whatever. I, I think that you just you need to pick up this book and read it because I think it's very representational of the challenges of just being a young adult and going through uh, a, a love affair that's really toxic for the first time in your life. 
which I think we all will go through. Puberty's a bitch, people. It is. It is. Well, we hope you enjoyed that uh, past review of Laura Dean uh, Keeps Breaking Up With Me. But we're not breaking up with you. We're going to be right back after these commercial breaks with more of The Last Comic. <laughs> that was horrible. Stay tuned. <laughs> it's not you, it's me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kevin DeCristofano. And I'm Sean Flanagan. And we are the Ninja Turtle Nerds, your weekly podcast covering the Ninja Turtle comic book series one issue at a time. Plus the video games, the cartoon show, the VHS tapes. If it's Ninja Turtles, we'll cover it. Ninja Turtle Nerds is available wherever you get your podcast. Has this ever happened to you? You're in bed, drifting off, and suddenly think... Who would win in a tug-of-war match between Superboy and Merlin? Did Marvel ever try to make a long-haul trucker into a superhero? How would it work out if I named my dog after a D-list supervillain? The answers in order are Merlin. Yes. And amazing. I'm Jessica. And I'm Mike. And we host the podcast Ten Cent Takes, a show that looks at weird, silly, and cool moments from comics and how they're woven into the larger fabric of history. Moments like the time Superman shilled for Radio Shack. When Archie got tempted by the devil. Oh, and then there was that time that DC Comics gave a superhero AIDS in an effort to be topical. It's always weird around here, but we'd like to think it's also interesting. So come with us and commit random acts of pop culture archaeology, one issue at a time. If you'd like to learn more, head over to TenCentTakes.com. Coming to you live from whatever podcast you're currently listening to, it's your boy Jay West with my co-host Mac East from the We Get Dub Podcast. What up, nerds? It's me, Mac East, and we got a badass anime podcast for you. We got hot sauce, we got hot takes, we got booze and banter. And you can listen to us on all major platforms. The We Get Dub Podcast hits harder than a Goku gut punch. <laughs> Alright, we're back with more of The Last Comic Shop, although I'm not sure what we're back to, given that we didn't have any other content planned for this week's show, other than... Hey, what's that red blinky light on the Archive Rama 3000 there? See? Um, blink. Blink. I, I, blink. I'm not sure, honestly. The instruction manual is being used to prop up one of the sides of our Dig Dug arcade cabinet upstairs. Okay, I'm just going to push this button then. Welcome to the Archive Rama 3000 voicemail messaging service. You have 6,642 unread messages. Great Caesar's ghost! We've been getting voicemails this whole time? What if someone had urgent comic book-related business they wanted to discuss with us? Well, I'm sure they're just spam messages. Let's find out. Playing message 001 of 6,642. Hey guys, this is Mike from Tencent Takes, the podcast that looks at weird, interesting, and cool moments from comic books and how they intertwine with pop culture and history. And this is Jessica. So we have two questions for you, and I'm going to kick things off. What's the one comic in your collection that's the coolest? Not the most expensive, not the rarest, just the one that you love to tell people about when they ask you about something special that you have. And my question is, what is the one comic that pops into your brain when you think back in childhood about comics? Thanks so much for having us on, guys. Have a good one. And if any of your listeners are interested in checking us out, you can find us where you find podcasts and at TencentTakes.com. That, that was just some good questions from Tencent Takes. Um, and again, you probably heard their commercial just during the commercial breaks. Yeah, they're good friends of ours. And uh, yeah, when it comes to coolest comic book, I know mine, and, it, and it's really easy. Uh, that's that great issue of DC Comics Presents. Where Superman and He-Man fight in From Eternia with Death. And uh, it's, it's an awesome story where Skeletor brings Superman to Eternia and then takes over his brain and somehow, because it's always about mind control. But basically, you have Superman and He-Man. And this is pre-crisis Superman. You know, the guy that could reverse the Earth trading punches with each other and even the power sword cuts his clothes and like it's just a great issue it's really hard to write sometimes pre-crisis superman but man i love that i love that book so if you can ever find that in like anywhere i would highly recommend it because it's it's a great crossover when it comes to comic books from my youth one that i immediately think of 
Marvel Tales 143, uh, which was my first comic book ever, which is a reprinting of Spider-Man versus the Lizard, and I've talked about that on a previous show. Another really great book is from the original Star Wars Marvel line. And there was a great issue called Riders from the Void. And it came out right before the Empire Strikes Back movie adaptation. And it was actually kind of like a fill-in issue. And it was drawn by Michael Golden. And later on in life, I got to meet Michael Golden. And I got to ask him the, the story behind that issue because it's got, like, Princess Leia being wrapped up in tentacles. And there's this robot that's trying to attack Luke with, like, a lightsaber. And it just captivated my imagination when I was a kid. And it turns out that, like, the issue was done in, like, three days. Like, Archie Goodwin wrote it and then sent it to Michael Golden. It was crazy how this issue came together. But, like, even for back in the day, it was, like, inked on the fly, and it was all this wacky stuff. But, um, yeah, Riders from the Void. I think it's issue 38. So, yeah, those are my picks. What about you, J.A.? Coolest comic, probably have to say Rye Zero. Wow. It was basically Jim Shooter and Bob Layton laying out what was going to be at that time the next 10 years of Valiant Comics. Set up Bloodshot, it set up Deathmate too, but we're going to ignore that. And it was just cool to see the amount of world building they put in one single issue. I mean, now it would be like a 12-part miniseries, but this was just one single issue, Valiant at its peak and... Jim Shooter at his writing. Uh, so I would say that is just a really, really well done issue of world building and connecting sort of Valiant's present day heroes with their future heroes in Magnus Robot Fighter and Rai, the Future Force, and all the new comics they had coming out at that point. In terms of like the one comic book from my childhood that I immediately sort of remember and love to this day is uncanny x-men 251 with that incredible mark silvestri cover of wolverine on the x cross he's down under and he's been tacked up to the cross by the reavers and he's going through all these fever dreams and it ends with jubilee pulling him off the cross and you just know that 252 is going to be a banger of an issue because he's going to go get his revenge on all the reavers who've left him up there to die in the sun Ah, nice nice awesome all right chad you're up what are, what's your coolest comic and your kid your childhood comic okay so my coolest comic uh, i was thinking about this i have a, a ton of uh, great amazing spider-man issues and i thought about uh the last part of the master planner saga or you know there's those pages that define what spider-man is but uh, uh the one i'm gonna go with is actually my copy of amazing spider-man 50 the spider-man no more it's the first appearance of the kingpin and i was lucky enough to get it signed by the great john ramita at the baltimore comic-con uh many many years ago before i even understood like what a huge deal that was and so i had this super iconic cover uh with one of the greatest artists uh, of all time that that probably qualify as the coolest in my collection there uh, and then the one that I think of uh, from my childhood is Daredevil 281, and it's the, wrapping up the big saga with John Romita Jr. art and uh, Anna Senti writing, and it's Daredevil, and he's fighting his way through Hades, uh, you know, on his way to meet Mephisto, and all these demons are attacking him, and he's swinging, and I can still think of the, the splash page where he's like, uh, where am I? What am I doing? And then he realizes that by fighting, he's playing in to Mephisto's plans. And so he just stops. He holds up his torch, and he's that beacon of light. And man, blew my mind. I loved it then. I love it still. That whole run is great. So yeah, yeah. Daredevil 281 is where I'm going to go with that one. Cool. All right. Well, Here's our next voicemail message, uh, and it comes from Shortbox Summary. Playing message 002 of 6,642. Hello, Last Comic Shop. George here from Shortbox Summary, a comics podcast that is currently all about Marvel Comics from the mid-2000s. Thank you so much for the opportunity to ask a question to one of my favorite shows. 
So, in the way Venom was at the center of King and Black, Hulkling was at the center of Empire, Spider-Woman with Secret Invasion, Thor with War of the Realms, so on and so forth, which Marvel character would you most like to see anchor an event in the near future? And follow-up question, what sort of event would you like to see them in? Thank you so much. Can't wait for the next episode. I've got uh, it. Uh, is it cheating right. if I say magic? No. Oh, it it kind of sort of is because this is wait. going on with an event oh, right no. now with the labors of magic and all that. Exactly. But that's – that's the, come on. That's not fair. I would have said magic. But now they're mating a magic because they know how awesome she is. <laughs> I was surprised you didn't say Silver Surfer. I'm surprised. Oh, okay. Whole event around. That, yes. We had Silver Surfer. I mean, Infinity Gauntlet, I know not the movie, but the book was Silver Surfer anchored that. I don't know. Really? It would be nice not to see. Not Adam Warlock. Silver Surfer no. anchored that book? Yeah, they were a yin and yang. First one, okay, yeah, Infinity War was Adam Warlock and his evil counterpart, Magus, but the first one was more Silver Surfer. Mm. He was the key. It would be nice to see some more Surfer. There's not enough Surfer in the universe. After the disaster that was the Dan Slot run, <laughs> thankfully we had some some good uh, Silver Surfer Black. So maybe we could return to that. Or you just you I do like the the current Silver Surfer Legacy uh, run that Ron Lim is putting out. So it would be nice to see some Silver Surfer crossover. Well, I, I, I'm I going to go back to the 90s for my pick. I say you should do an event all around Sleepwalker. Yes, Ooh. Sleepwalker. <laughs> and hear me out on this one. Because I had an, uh, an opportunity recently to revisit Incredible Hulk 300. Where basically, the Hulk goes crazy. He loses his brain because I think he's uh, mentally attacked by Nightmare and made to basically lose all of the Bruce Banner parts of him. So he's just a mindless Hulk, and he just fights the entire Marvel Universe. And it made me think that, like, wow, actually Nightmare is... He's a pretty interesting villain, if you use him right. Because the whole notion of, like, dreams and and nightmares, uh, all of the Marvel characters would have them. And I'm sure it's been done before, but I don't know if it's done been done well. So my crossover would be what would happen if all of the Marvel characters suddenly started having bad dreams that they could not wake up from. And, and you could talk about each one of their bad dreams. And they ultimately Sleepwalker has to save them because he's the defender of dreams. And maybe you make him more important. I don't know. I just like Sleepwalker. And I think it's time for him to have like a Guardians of the Galaxy kind of resurgence here. All right, Yikes. Chad, you're up. What's your... Right, I'm going to go with the most obvious choice. Just because I, I, I can relate to this character. Because he has managed to to make a lot of people mad. And so, uh, this character, he has, in the process of making so many people so mad, has accumulated what I think is the best stable of villains all around. And so, what I would love to see is an Acts of Vengeance style crossover where all the different heroes in the Marvel universe have to deal with all the Spider-Man villains. And maybe we go reverse and have them get the power cosmic from Captain Universe and some wacky turnabout of events. And the Marvel universe has to deal with a cosmic green goblin or a cosmic venom or a cosmic electro or a cosmic Willy Lumpkin. I don't know. But, uh, cosmic I, carnage. Cosmic carnage. You know, all the Spider-Man villains, they don't even need to necessarily all go cosmic. But, uh, you know, bring in your paste pot peats, bring in your beetles, bring in your tombstones, your kingpins, like all these awesome villains that are out there. And, like, I was trying to think about it. I can't think of a major event that Spider-Man has anchored. Can you? So, I mean, does does that Spider Island count? Like, does no. that maximum <laughs> carnage count? Honestly, that's as far back as you'd have to go to find something. But uh, he hasn't had that big company-wide story. And it's okay. Spider-Man. Now, if you have a cosmic vulture, isn't that essentially just a Hawkman? <laughs> <laughs> Give him a mace. That's true. And it is kind of funny. The first thing I thought of when you said Cosmic Carnage, I'm like, oh boy, that seems like one of those really bad roller coasters. Like, we rode the Cosmic Carnage! 
Woo! It had two loops. It went forward, and then it went backwards, <laughs> and then it went forwards again. And one guy threw up straight up in the air and hit it all of us three times. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I like it, though. Although, again, they could give cosmic powers to Electro. He'd still be a stooge. He'd still <laughs> somehow mess it up because that's his job. Max yeah. Dillon. He's like the Rodney Dangerfield of Spider-Man. He gets no respect. Cosmic J. Jonah Jameson, the best character ever, <laughs> the most power ever. Bring it to me, Parker. I need <laughs> All right, our next voicemail message is coming from the Ninja Turtle nerds. We're starting to get into licensed comic books now, Ooh. which is good. Because licensed comic books are important. So, yeah, let's listen to their question. Playing message 003 of 6,642. Hello, Last Comic Shop. Kevin here from the Ninja Turtle Nerds with a question for your podcast. So, there's been a lot of talk about a few Ninja Turtle movie projects currently in the works. And obviously, like the first movie, it's going to focus on Shredder and the Foot Clan. You got to do that first. But my question for you is if the new TMNT film gets a follow-up, which would you rather see? The turtles on a cosmic outer space adventure with aliens like the Triceratons and their robot friend Fugitoid, or a wacky sci-fi adventure on Earth with Baxter Stockman and the Mousers and more technology and something like The Fly, maybe? Both of these types of stories have shown up all over the Ninja Turtle comic books, so it's something we talk about on our show, a lot is what we'd like to see in a future movie. Curious what your thoughts are. Thank you very much. All right. Is it a cosmic space adventure or is it something more akin to, again, going back to Baxter Stockman, doused with mutagen and turning into the fly monster and all the mousers and everything like that. What do you guys think? We'll start with Chad. Well, I don't traditionally read the turtles very often, but I had recently just finished the last run where it brings in Baxter Stockman and it brings in Fugitoid and it brings in so many elements of the Ninja Turtles. And boy, if it was just a, a one-off movie, that would be awesome to see. But for me, at the end of the day, I, I I love all the wacky characters in the Turtles and the Mousers. I don't know why, but the Mousers are the coolest design, little robot crunchy stars. Yeah! Anytime you can chrome things out like that, I think that's the way I would go. Right. No, the Mousers are awesome. I remember I had that uh, that reprint, that color reprint with the Shredder story and the Mouser story growing up, the original uh, Eastman and Laird. And, and it was one of my favorite comic books of, of like fifth and sixth grade. I love that. <laughs> Anyways, Jay, what do you say? I have to say I would go cosmic, I, especially if they can get James Gunn to direct it. Can you imagine how cool that would be? Turtles With all in their space. dinosaur friends. And- yes, turtles in space. It would just be a f- fun story. I think you have a chance to really go out there and, and see stuff that maybe we haven't seen enough of. Or, or I mean, even like Guardians of the Galaxy, with the exception of Rocket Raccoon, it's, you still have humans and stuff. So you could go really creatureistic. Creatureistic, is that a word? Yeah, it's a it word now. now. I love it. Like futuristic and creatures. Creatureistic with it. So I'm going turtles in space. I, I think I would go with neither. Mm. I, I like my turtles to be street level. I like my turtles being as realistic as possible, even though they're you can't Giant really turtles be that eat pizza. Exactly. I want them to tap into like the ninjutsu stuff and kind of stuff like they do with Daredevil. Have them go to some mystic lost city in the in the Himalayas or something. Investigate the roots of the Foot Clan somewhere. I, I I I keep on going back to the great Ninja Turtles animated film that they released in the in the mid two thousands. Ancient statues that came to life, and I loved that. I really did. Raphael and and Leonardo fighting with each other in street battles. Uh, but that's my Ninja Turtles. Again, they probably do that with the Shredder stuff, but they should just follow up with that. What about Rat King? Rat King He's would be cool. Push. See, that would be street level. Because then you get like Casey Jones and April O'Neil, and they actually make sense. And they're, 
I, I will be honest. Sometimes I like Casey Jones and April O'Neil more than I like the Turtles. I love Casey Jones. Give me more Casey. He's awesome. Hey, so it's now time for our next voicemail message. What's that smell? Is, oh, what is, is that? Birding? Is the archive burning? Oh, There's so many. Turn it off. Turn it off. Hold the clutch. Hold the clutch. <laughs> oh, we got to take this thing into the shop. <laughs> oh. No, that's not a good smell at all. It's either bad meat or good cheese. Oh, I hope we didn't do any permanent damage. Uh, hey, look, well, though, there's uh, there's actually some messages that are still printed out, though. I, maybe I can just read them. Uh, so this one comes from the We Get Dubbed podcast. Again, we, I think we just l- heard their message in the commercial break. So Spider-Man has one of the most iconic rogues galleries. Agreed. Uh, yeah. Who is the best addition over the last 20 years? They said they were thinking this because it seems like Chasm and Kindred missed the mark recently, at least for them. (laughs) And part two of that question is, if you think there hasn't been any new additions to the rogues gallery, why do you think that is? Like, why do you think that no character has been able to elevate even among characters like the Molten Man or the Prowler in the past? I guess to Chad, you're you're a resident Spider-Man aficionado. Is there been a Spider-Man villain in the last 20 years that you feel like is in that top tier? Well, let me first say the Molten Man is awesome. The Prowler is great. Hobie Baker. Uh, Anyway, uh, no, the character I'm going to give you is... A great character, but I, I feel like people may not be a fan of this one. But I'm going to say Janice Lincoln. The new okay. Beatle. Yeah. She has been vital in a number of great stories, whether it's Superior Foes of Spider-Man, the whole Nick Spencer run on the title proper. And even today, she's still, you know, working in as part of the, the Tombstone story with this latest relaunch of Spider-Man. And so it was between her and Mr. Negative, who's also a really cool looking villain. Yeah, but, uh, I think Janice has uh, has more legs, both figuratively and metaphorically. <laughs> you know what? There's been some great designs for Spider-Man villains over the past 20 years. I really liked what the anti-venom. Yeah, like, he had an awesome look to him. He looked even better than the regular venom. But he doesn't count because I guess he's still Eddie Brock. So, like, I, I guess I can't count him. But you're right. Mr. Negative was a great villain. Wasn't there that other villain that came out during the brand new day? What, what Menace? It was like oh, the yeah. Goblin. She had a good look to her, too. There's um, the Goblin Queen recently. But I can honestly say that probably the main reason why no character has really took off other than the original Spider-Man foes is because... There was something special about what Steve Ditko was doing back in the day. That was like lightning in a bottle. You couldn't recreate that. And even after John Romita came onto that book, who did they introduce? Rhino and Kingpin? Great villains. But like compared to the output that Steve Ditko was putting out, really two more real big heavy hitters to that rogues gallery. And then after that, what did you have? Like Venom. Venom and Carnage. So I think you, you overlooked Hobgoblin, which everyone will say is just, just a remade Green Goblin. But I beg to differ, sir. He has a much better costume. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I like the Hobgoblin a lot myself. And I also, you know, they, they did introduce the Black Cat. But I think that's because, again, the Black Cat is just a remake of Catwoman. And we already know that works. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. Venom was the idea of the equal but opposite character that is a major trope of all comic book villains whether you have reverse flash or sinestro or bizarro wario (laughs) all right well we've got one more message here let me go ahead and see if i can read this one uh so this one comes from con conversations they're a Star Wars podcast that we're good friends with, and they said, which Star Wars storyline or arc would you love to see inked into a comic book? It can be a specific set of episodes or a scene from a movie that would go into greater detail panel by panel. Or, which character would you love to see have its own one-shot title? So, J.A., what specific episode or story arc or something would you like to see in comic book form? 
So this was actually a deleted scene in Empire Strikes Back. It never happened. They ended up getting rid of it. But it would be fun to explore in a one shot. I, I don't think it probably holds up as a series, but definitely a one shot. There was a scene in Hoth where the Wampas were attacking the base. Yes! <laughs> and they got, they deleted it because they couldn't get the Wampas to look right. And, and I would love to see, like, full-on Wampa mania. <laughs> oh, like, the Wampas working together in concert to attack Hoth base. Oh, that would be awesome! You could totally do a one-shot of that. Or even, even a couple issues. Especially if you did it, like, base under siege. Tapping some horror tropes couple rebel soldiers disappear and the next thing you know they're like awesome. right right you could do aliens like bits of echo base are suddenly you know losing power and you send somebody down to fix it and suddenly they're gone and then more is losing power you've got a scene where the lights go out and then luke knights his lightsaber to light up the room and there's a wampa behind him well that's the thing yeah. Star Wars really does have some pretty terrifying creatures in their arsenal but none of them are ever played for that horror aspect, right? They're never played by, like, how grotesque or, like, awful they look. You would be legitimately scared of a wampa if you saw it. Like, it is a giant snow monster. It can rip your arms off. You would be terrified. Yeah, I agree. That's an awesome pick. I, so, I just yeah. thought of another scene. You, and who would love to see, like, a wampa go toe-to-toe with Chewie? Yeah. And, like, ah. slugging it out. <laughs> Chad, do you have any picks? To answer this question in reverse, I want a movie about the murder droids from the Darth Vader comic. (laughs) Yes! They don't make an appearance in one of these shows on Disney+. Plus. I'm going to be P.O.'d. But in any case, that's all the, I think, all the time we have for questions. If you have a question to ask Comic Shop, make sure that you either send us a DM on Twitter or Instagram, or just send us an email at uh, lastcomicshoppodcast at gmail.com. That's a great way that you can get in touch with us all the time. And we'll answer it next time. We've got nothing else to do. And we hope that you come back next week for more of The Last Comic Shop. I promise we're not going to go back to the archive, although I promised that before. What? Strike! Strike! Quiet! Rate, review, and subscribe over at www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com to the place where you can find stuff that's not scab-worthy. It's more binge-worthy. You can go ahead and click on a lot of episodes and listen to them one after one after another after another. Plus, links to YouTube. What else do we got, Chad? How else they can contact us to send us some of their awesome questions? I forgot I'm on strike. Piss off. What's Instagram and Twitter at Last Comic Shop? Fine, I'll do your job for you. J.A., where can they find some t-shirts? They can find t-shirts and placards that say we're on strike. Oh, oh right. fine. You can get a great summertime shirt. It's great. It's a summertime shirt. You can get it out at our website, www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com. There's a link there. Are you going to make me do all of this, guys? Come on, do something. Tell us about some recommendations of comic books they could read, right? He loved we've, that part. We've been holding these signs all day, not for nothing. Strike! 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 Right. Well, host of the host, Amy Larson. I'm joined by Chad Smith and Jay Scott, and we hope that you stay safe, stay at your jobs, and remember, I'm not really the boss here. They just want to paint me as management, but I have needs too. What about my needs, guys? Why, when can I go on strike? Listen, we're not doing the sound effects, dude. We don't know how. <laughs> the last comic shop was a 2022 Black Angus production. Black Angus.